Hey everyone, um, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, my name is Brian House. I'm Vice President of Product Marketing at Acquia. Um, and I wanna welcome and thank you all for coming to the session today. Um, we've got a really, really very good session. Um, uh, it's my distinct pleasure to have Mike Lamb um, from Pfizer here. Mike uh, runs their uh, Director of Technology for their digital marketing platform. Um, and so Mike's gonna come in here and share a little bit of Pfizer's story about how they use Drupal to build a digital marketing platform to power all of their consumer brands. Um, and so I've been working with Mike for the last few years, um, as long as a large team at, at Acquia to help them think about the role that Drupal could play at Pfizer, how it competes versus some of the other technologies they had in place and some of the other technologies they were considering, um, and then why they ultimately you know, selected Pfizer. And Mike's got some great slides to walk through that process and then how they use it. You know, one of the questions that we get all the time from organizations, I just had the conversation this morning, is help me understand other people's successes. You know, my peers in my industry, in my title, and that are trying to, you know, meet similar business objectives. And so, you know, important piece of what we do at Acquia is to share those case studies. Sometimes those are Acquia customers, like in a case with Pfizer, sometimes they're not. But I think spreading the word about Drupal, there's a lot of great technical pieces of the story but there's also a lot of great business successes um, and also the results and sort of where you get from that. And so this is you know, a big piece of what we do and we love when we have customers like Mike who are willing to do that um, and to share their story so that way you can learn and think about how to sell this in your clients or inside your own organization, how to do greater investment in Drupal. Um, so what we're gonna do is Mike's gonna walk through some slides then we're gonna sit down and have a Q and A. Um, so I'm gonna ask a couple questions and then I'd really love for you guys to ask questions and participate in here. So we've got microphones, there's a mic in the middle of the room. So I know it's always hard to be the first person to ask a question. Um, so, uh, so we have lots of plants, so we'll get over that now. So, so don't be shy, and then once we usually get one or two, then uh, the questions start to roll. So we'll get you guys involved as well. So certainly be active and listening and, uh, and, and think of some good questions for Mike. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Mike Lamb. Thanks, guys. So it's, it's, it's really exciting to be sharing what we're doing with, with Drupal at Pfizer. But I have to intro with my first slide from my legal department. This is, the, this is the first time we're actually publicly sharing anything or officially sharing anything about what we're doing with Drupal. And as much as that's a, that's a very exciting time for us, it comes with, with some, some conditions. So I'll let you read that as I move on past that. So Pfizer have been using Drupal for a while now, actually. So, so we started with Drupal 4.7, and we started with that with a, with a few internal sites. So a few intranet sites, like knowledge sharing sites that we, sorry, terms, that we, we built using, using Drupal 4.7. That really got us very excited in, 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 in this technology, in this area, and we really started closely watching the project at that point. We, we evaluated Drupal 6 a number of times for external facing, external facing projects. But many of those projects were, were very large, and we were hoping they would turn into a global platform um, off the back of those first projects. We didn't, we didn't feel like Drupal 6 was quite there yet, so we hadn't, we hadn't selected that. But the moment Drupal 7 came out, it really, the timing really worked very well for us with one of our global business units, our consumer health business unit, who make uh, Advil, uh, Anadin, Centrum, Robitussin, Chapstick, etc. They were doing a global assessment. They really wanted to put a, put a new content management system in place for all the consumer-facing facing brands. So that happened in Q1 2011, and Drupal 7 was selected as a global technology at that point. So this was the first time we, we, we really got, we got serious about implementing Drupal, and it was, it was a very exciting time. So I was, I was running the project to implement Drupal 7, and I was about six to eight, eight weeks into that project, and there was a larger, larger assessment assessment underway. So consumer represents about five or six percent of Pfizer's revenue, which, which doesn't sound a lot, but that's a multi-billion dollar company. So that was a, it was a, it was a large, large company we were then supporting with Drupal. The second assessment was for the biopharma, biopharma business, so really like 90 percent of, of Pfizer's, Pfizer's revenue, the lion's share of Pfizer, were doing an equal assessment to say which, which content management system should we use. So with only, only six or so weeks experience with with Drupal 7 and implementing this within consumer, we, we fought to get Drupal 7 on, on the list of, of projects to be evaluated. And we went through that whole evaluation process actually together with Acquia, with, with, with Brian and team. And then a year later in, in Q1 2012, at the very beginning of Q1 actually, we selected 
Drupal and Acquia to be our, our global platform for all of, all of commercial at Pfizer. So this is really every market, all of, all of our commercial products, their, their digital offerings would be, be delivered using Drupal. Now consider that the real, real beginning of large-scale Drupal at Pfizer. So we're only about 18 months in. So it's really, this, this still is kind of chapter one of our Drupal story and we're, we're very excited about what's to come. The case for why we wanted to do this was, was actually pretty clear. I mean, the requirements from brand teams everyone's, everyone's very familiar with. I mean, the expectation on, on any digital delivery organization is continuing to rise. We have to build sites with more capabilities, more features, they have to be mobile. There's more and more we have to build. There's no room, especially in a regulated industry, to even get, you just can't compromise on quality. These, these more complex properties have to be the highest quality they possibly can be. A wider audience, you're, you're typically publishing these to, especially when we're, we're some of our consumer products have uh, you know, been advertised with uh, competitions and things on social networks. At the same time, you, you know, this is a given, you've got to deliver all of this, but you've got to deliver it faster and you've got to deliver it cheaper. So this was really the case for implementing some of these global platforms. And implementing a platform of this size while, while doing all these things is, is certainly a challenge to be addressed. The, the environment in which we operate isn't, isn't simple. So at the most basic level, I consider, consider Pfizer was to be our regions made up of our individual markets, and then our, our business units with, with our individual products. And then at the intersection of each one of these, we typically have a demanding brand team who, whose job it is to promote a particular product in their market. And at the intersection, you can actually have many dozens of web properties. You know, what we, we market to healthcare professionals, to patients, we have disease awareness sites, we have sites with medical content, we have sites with promotional content that have to be separated. You have sites for, for events, you have many, many different properties in each, in each one of these, these, these intersections. There are also lots of integrations with third parties, etc. that need to happen. It's, it's, even in one of these boxes, it can be very, very challenging. And the default behavior is to, for that brand team to go and engage a company and implement you know, a snowflake solution, I call it, in, e in, each one of those, in each one of those markets. You'll have little, little pockets of consistency if you're lucky, but really there's it's snowflake solutions on a market-by-market -market basis. There's, there is some merit to this solution. It's, you know, it's horrifically expensive, of course, and it's, 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 it's not at all efficient. But those requirements I was talking about in terms of quality, you know, integrations, et cetera, they're not simple requirements typically. So you do get to market with, with the individual brand's timeline with their individual requirements. But you know, everybody here knows this, this, isn't gonna, this isn't gonna make sense on a large scale. And this is, this is still the simple version of the picture. That's a 50 by 50 grid of these intersections. And in 18 months at Pfizer, we've already implemented to implemented Drupal in 46 markets across 86, sorry, 84 different products. So that's 18 months in, and there are lots of boxes there still to be filled. And it's, it's a very, very big grid. It can be very complicated very quickly. So if you want to build a global platform, a single global platform on a core set of technologies to meet this requirement, it has to be very, very flexible. You have to understand what needs to happen in each one of these, and the platform has to be very flexible. So we know we selected Drupal, but very quickly how we got to, got to selecting Drupal. I mean, I don't think our, our, our process was too different to what I've seen in other organizations, but really what it boiled down to was evaluating the different technologies with our critical use cases, understanding what the differentiators were between these technologies, and in a lot of time there were proprietary solutions that we were comparing to open source. So really understanding those two environments and how they work and then coming down to the list of pros and cons, like we, we, we really need to understand if we were to implement solution X versus solution Y in Pfizer, what are the real pros and cons that we're going to see for, for implementing these? So I said it's about six or, we were about six or eight weeks ahead with that previous selection. So the, by the time we, we got through this, this evaluation, we were learning more and more about Drupal. So as much as we came out of the evaluation selecting Drupal, which was great, we came out of that selection really knowing what, what we had to tackle to implement Drupal on a global scale at, at Pfizer. So we found three, or we listed three key challenges that we wanted to address as part of our implementation. And for each one of these challenges, our objective was to put in a short-term solution. So this was, this was a solution that, that Pfizer would invest in, a point solution, us putting our finger in the dam to say, we are gonna fix this, or we're gonna, we're gonna solve this challenge so we can continue with our global implementation. And then we're gonna put in a long-term solution, or 
typically the long-term solution is a greater investment where we want to be working with you know, groups like LSD or the, the community to, to, to plan for a long-term solution for implementing these kind of technologies at Pfizer. So the first challenge was enterprise deployment. I mean, this isn't a new topic for, for many people, but it was, a, it was a real challenge for us. And when it, the, 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 the key challenge around this, this at Pfizer was, it's a regulated industry, and the thought of editing on production, or editing content on production, is just, it's just a non-starter. Your, your content will not go near a production environment until it's, it's absolutely perfect and ready to be published. So we, we had to put in a short-term solution or an immediate solution to, to solve for this. So we put in a continuous integration environment based on Jenkins for, for various reasons. But then we put in some scripts to move an application from staging to production to, 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 to allow for this, this process. We also put in some guidelines so our various vendor partners could build applications that would work in, in this, this way. And that's worked very well. I mean, this has been in place for, for 18 months now. It's been, been very successful. Long term, we're investing in, in a collection of tools called WF Tools um, to, to handle our, our entire continuous integration and workflow, workflow requirements. There's actually a Pfizer session tomorrow to talk more about WF Tools and, and what, what that really is. And the combination of WF Tools with Seven, then ultimately WF Tools, which we're, we're really planning and implementing now to complement Drupal 8, we feel like this, this challenge just disappears off the radar for Drupal. Uh, we're, we're very excited about what comes as, as these things naturally progress. The second one was the, the content editor's experience. So personally, I, I, I feel that Drupal gets a bit of unfair, bad press about the content, content editor's experience. Lots of people talk about it, but we've implemented a lot of systems that are a lot worse, a lot worse in, in this area. So the key challenge for content editing at Pfizer was not just editing the content you know, and, and having inline editing or a WYSIWYG editor. It was the person who was editing the content ultimately had to run a Jenkins script in order to get that onto production. So it wasn't something that, that a business user was really going to be doing. So to start off with, we, we have a highly trained centralized content entry team so that we can manage this on, on many, many sites on a large scale. Long term, we're very excited about Spark and what's coming with that project. And Spark combined with, with, with WF Tools and, and Drupal 8, again, we really feel like this, this disappears off, off the map. Content editors will be able to be able to edit their content and then publish it in, in our very complex work, within our very complex workflow requirements without any real challenges. The third and final one is around Drupal resourcing. So in, this, in our first experience implementing for consumer, where, where again we had to implement hundreds of sites, we very quickly realized to implement hundreds of, hundreds of websites on Drupal, you don't need hundreds of PHP developers, you need dozens of Drupalists. And the, the model in which large organizations typically are sourcing or were typically sourcing the technical skills to, to work on uh, these kind of projects through large systems integrators didn't immediately jive, jive with Drupal, particularly back then with, uh, at the, you know, the beginning of Drupal 7. I think it's, it's constantly improving, but it didn't, it didn't quite work at that scale at that time. So what we did to start off with, we engaged with a number of dedicated Drupal shops. So we, we, we went and signed contracts and started working with a few Drupal shops, and a lot of our Drupal demand has been met in that way. Longer term, I mean, the, the, the number of sites we're deploying on Drupal is only ever increasing. We hope to leverage our SaaS offering, um, and our, I'll share more about that in a bit, to help with our, our demand of the number of sites we have to launch. But then also interested in engagements with, with larger systems integrators as, as, as more and more large companies are investing more and more in Drupal, really getting Drupal on the list of their key technologies, as we know that these larger companies have a lot of influence when it comes to getting, getting people trained up on these technologies. So there's, there's certainly some potential for the long term there as well. When it came to the advantage of implementing Drupal, it, it was really interesting, because anybody who really got to know Drupal, or had, had, had attended a DrupalCon, or anybody technical, they were very, very passionate about Drupal. So in these sessions, they really, they, they wanted, it to, they wanted it to win, they wanted to implement this technology. But sometimes articulating that against a very big proprietary solution with a list of a thousand features is, is a bit more difficult. So this was my, my attempt internally that I'll share with you of how I was trying to compare this to some of our previous implementations, which were almost exclusively proprietary tools. So we have lots of different projects, of course, with, with lots of different sizes and complexities. Some of these projects are very, very different. And the typical model that we found was to go buy a big proprietary solution. You know, this, is the, this is the proprietary solution, your license, that has a thousand features. Everything that you ask, does this solution do, do this? Absolutely the answer is yes. So we come and implement this solution. 
excuse me, and it does everything, but it doesn't really do quite what we needed it to do. In, in, in my analogy, it's, it's, the, it's a square peg in the round hole, so bear with me as I take you through this. So the typical model is we get this big proprietary solution, and then we customize it. We work with one of our systems integrators, we customize it, which takes some time and costs us some money, and we get a little bit closer. But we do this over and over and over again, to the point that we end up with something that didn't look like the original project, the product that we bought, doesn't look like what we want to implement or what we actually wanted to implement. It's over-engineered in some cases and then misses key requirements. And this is a, this is actually a very common pattern that I've seen in the past when we've implemented proprietary tools in this space. And that circle changes shape as well as you're implementing these projects and get, get quite challenging. So we get to this point and we go speak to the person that you know, sold, us this, sold us this tool, it, it, you know, it doesn't quite work. And they have a new version of this that does 1,000, <laughs> 1,100 things at this point. It didn't look like the original tool, but we're still stranded on our island. We can't, we can't get to this, we can't get to this new, uh, new upgrade. And you see this pattern, and I've seen platforms that have been implemented using this pattern, and they don't, they don't go past a dozen implementations. You can't, you can't scale this past a dozen implementations before you run out, before you run out of money. So you see pretty quickly, it's not going to work, and you, you don't end up with, with happy, happy business users. So the better way I consider really is what we're doing with Drupal, is we have the very lightweight Drupal core, and we put, you know, of course, Drupal core is across, <laughs> across every single one of our sites, unaltered. We're not hacking core, we're not touching this. It's consistent across every single one of our sites. On top of that, we add in the uh, Pfizer platforms. This is the Pfizer platform of installation profiles, you know, standard modules that we, we want to implement across every single one of our sites. Um, it's, again, consistent, unhacked across every single one of our sites. That really helps us to, to put that base of this platform in place. Then on top of that, you have the magic contribution of Contrib and Custom. So between your own special source for each one of these sites, if you like, and through this combination, we can meet any of these requirements. And actually, the size of the box, if you actually looked at Contrib, is huge. But the magic is you really are only picking those individual pieces, and you, you're, you're in good shape to be able to, 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 to implement. So this is, this is kind of my internal Drupal story. Of course, you, you're all very familiar with, with Drupal, but this is, this is how I was trying to articulate internally why I felt this was so different and we were so passionate about this versus proprietary tools that we'd implemented before. So talking a bit about our implementation specifically, I say we're really 18 months in and we developed hundreds of websites. Well, said differently, we're hundreds of business days in and we developed hundreds of websites. Now that can be very challenging. If you, want to, if you are really launching multiple websites per week, then it can be very disruptive. And we spoke about that at the beginning about you know, getting to market as fast as you possibly can and reducing cost. So we're not here in a position here where this solution is so magical that you can build a massive team to go and implement this. You need to be very, very efficient in how you're doing it. Excuse me. So at Pfizer, we have a massive, massive scale of different, different types of sites that we plan to deploy or we are deploying. From that one-page event site that's like a map of the event and the timing for the event, all the way up to a multilingual portal that um, is, 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 is deployed across many markets. It's actually almost a thousand x difference in, in terms of the size of these, these projects. And we have everything across the scale as well. And we've implemented multiple of every single one of these. And when, implementing, imp when planning to implement Drupal, it was, it was almost astounding to start off with the fact that we really felt like we had a platform that could deploy for every single one of these patterns. That, that, that was impressive in, it, in itself, but we realized that the model to deploy the largest site probably wouldn't be the most efficient model for, for deploying the, the smallest site. So we had, to, we had to figure something out there. So again, this is, this is how, I was, how I was sharing this internally. But to a brand manager, building a website in one of, those, one of those little snowflakes, there's a lot of things they've got to go and buy in order to deploy their, their particular site to their, uh, site to their market. And in this one-off scenario, they have, to, they have to stretch their budget across this entire, this entire spectrum. They've got to hit every single one of these boxes to some degree. They, of course, want to shift their investment as far up the scale as they possibly can. They want to be, be developing things that really differentiate Pfizer. They want to be de de delivering great content and great promotion and great strategy around that. They don't want to be talking about load balances and databases. But in this, in this one-off scenario, you really are in a bit of a catch-22 situation. Because if you don't balance this out and you end up spending all your money on promotion and no money on having a load-balanced environment or something that can scale, 
your campaign's not going to be successful. So the idea with the Drupal platform is we have two flavors of this platform. We have what we call internally our custom platform or our PaaS platform, where we as, as the core team, we, we define the infrastructure that you have. We make sure that meets a global requirement set, which isn't, isn't simple, but we make sure that that, that does meet, meet a global requirement set. The platform, again, of it turns out quite, quite what we're implementing, but um, the core and the platform is, again, consistent across every single one of our sites. And then when it comes to the features that are being implemented, there's a library you can choose from. So you can go and, go and of course, pick something from, from Contrib, or you can pick something that Pfizer have previously developed, and then, then implement that. This model pushes your investment far up, further up the scale. It's far more efficient. And it has almost unlimited flexibility. There's, we, we've developed lots of different types of sites on this platform, and it's, it really does have, have almost un, un, unlimited flexibility. But not every site needs unlimited flexibility. That, that first site that was just a branded site with a, a map of the event and you know, some, some steps of complexity on further than that didn't need unlimited, complex, uh, uh, sorry, unlimited flexibility. So we, we have a second platform we put in place, our SaaS platform, which is the gardens, where the, the, core, the core platform underneath this is identical. You know, the same versions of Drupal core, the same Pfizer standard modules we're deploying to every single one of these sites. But on top of that, we lock down the features that are available to each one of these, these marketing teams. When you're deploying hundreds of sites, you very quickly recognize a lot, of, a lot of consistency between them. You see key features that are on many, many of these sites. And if you can pick those out and get as many of those into your core SaaS platform as, as, as you can do, then it, this, this, this method of creating the many, the many of these sites becomes, becomes such more, more, more easier. So, this really pushes the investment all the way up the scale. So the pattern we see here when a brand manager wants to deploy a site is rather than coming in and starting with a basic Bartik site and building up from there, they come in and they see a site that's been, been deployed already to another market. It really meets their need. They take that site, they take the content, they adapt it for their market, they localize it for their, comp for their, for their market, and they deploy it. And if, if you can get into a model where you have enough, enough of your core features in this kind of platform, that many of your sites can be deployed in that, in, in that way, then launching multiple sites per week, gets, per week gets a lot easier. If the core or the technical build of the project that comes in on Tuesday can be done by Friday, then the, the following projects that you're, you're bringing in can get a, get a lot easier. It can, be, it, can be, um, it can be scalable without having thousands of people behind this. So in terms of, we talked about this, this, the, the standard expectations around capability. So one installation of Drupal. No, so this, these are all separate sites, but they're on one instance of Drupal. It's using, it's using Cloud Site Factory, Acquia Cloud Site Factory. So it's, it's one installation, one code base of Drupal, so our features are consistent across, consistent across these hundreds of sites, but they are individual sites. So the key reason for that is I find when we're implementing, implementing a particular site in multiple markets, it's easy to think that the process of taking this one campaign to multiple sites is just translation. But localizing content for multiple sites with different regulation, re regulations, different, uh, different environments can be very challenging. So we, we find by having multiple sites, it strikes the right balance for, for our industry to have consistency, but at the same time have flexibility for each one of the marketing teams. Um, that there are, there are you know, di very different regulatory env environments in each one of these markets we're deploying to. So it's, it's, it's often more complicated than the tran you know, translating content or showing slightly different things on a domain access model. Right. So, um, so you know, the, the core platform, what you're expected to do, responsive design, integration with, with various other systems is standard. It, it's there. Uh, it, it's, it's expected. But we've got to get into a situation where we, we, we get to market ever much faster and the cost for doing this is, is reduced. So clearly, this, is, this, this picture works in, in this way. You know, the one-off model is very expensive and it takes a very long time. It's, it's almost like the proprietary model the first time around. 
but then the pass model is ever so much faster and cheaper. And this, this met a lot of, this was, this was met a lot of expectations internally until you get to the point where you really need to scale. And when you really need to scale, you can get into a situation very easily or, or using this, this strategy where you can deliver sites in days, you know, in, in, in days in, in our kind of industry and de deliver them ever so much cheaper. So just some key lessons we've learned as we've, we've worked along, worked through this over the last 18 months. I must say it's, it's still early days. But focus on the right things. When, you're, when you are getting multiple requests in per week, you've got to be focusing on the right ones. So, so partner, partner for the commodities. So at this scale, we're not really in the luxury of saying uh, or, or hoping that things aren't going to break at some point. It's more being smart about figuring what's going to, what's, about what's going to break next and making sure that there is a, a team that's capable of fixing that ready at the side to go and, go and take care of that when it ultimately happens. So if you can take large parts of your infrastructure and let someone else deal with that for you, then you're going to be in a much better situation. So as much of those lower components, we, we, have, we, have, we have partners to, to deal with that for us. Take the software as a service approach from as, as many of the sites as possible. This is a, an internal learning uh, anyway, but every site thinks that they are their own special snowflake from the beginning. They think they have some custom requirement that's very special for them. But in reality, as long as you get into a situation where you can offer flexibility if it, if it comes to it or if it's absolutely necessary, and, and you have an alternative of I can deploy what you really need and I can deploy it very, very cost effectively in a number of days and the remainder of your budget can be spent on promotion, then you can have some realistic conversations about what is really going to drive effectiveness of this, of this campaign. Talking more to kind of like the domain access model, model piece, this is a big, big learning from the, from the beginning. It's one line, but it can be talked about for hours on end, but I really like implementing the model of having application independence by default and then layering, layering in the consistency that's necessary. So for example, on the SaaS platform, a consistent single installation of Drupal makes absolute sense. That's, that's, that's very easy. But on the custom platform, you can very quickly get in, into scenarios where you deploy one capability to, as we have done, to like 40 plus markets. And then market number 10 needs, needs an enhancement. And sometimes these enhancements in Drupal can be complicated. Sometimes we've had enhancements that need new modules that need the latest versions of PHP. And if we get into a situation where in order to get that market to meet its objective, I need to go and either engage with or regression test another 50 markets, then I'm not in a, I'm not in a very flexible situation. So application independence, independence by default, and, and then choose your level of consistency you want to layer on top of that. Build a team of Drupal rock stars. If you have the luxury of doing this, absolutely do this, especially if you're, you're operating at scale. So there are, there are 10 ways to do anything in Drupal, of course. You're going to do that anything multiple times. So pick the right way to do it and pick it or the right way for you to do it and do it consistently, consistently in that way. Some projects, especially if you're working with lots of different vendors, won't go as perfectly as you might hope. So be there to rescue those, be there to guide them when they get into trouble, to, to help them out. Develop a platform, so the platform we mentioned, have a team there to, to develop that. Have a team that understand what it means to make a change that's going to be deployed across many, many sites and ensure that appropriate level of consistency. Finally, implement your, your core functionality and strategy and we kind of consider that our internal, internal Drupal team, they're the creators of our continuous integration environment, our deployment environment, et cetera, et cetera but also our champions for things like BDD. So as we want to push this platform forward, but like behavioral driven development, these are the guys that are leading to say, this is the benefit to, to implement this, this on this scale and can help us put guidelines, et cetera, in place for how we actually get that implemented with, with, our, with our vendor partners. Finally, security. Of course, it's, it's a given that you have to be, there's no compromise around security here. And if you have a core team that's constantly watching your back or understanding what, what issues could be faced or what issues you could come up with here, then you're going to be in a better situation. So other than the, the questions which we'll do in a moment, just a plug for our session that we're doing tomorrow. So some of the Pfizer guys at the back of the room tomorrow are presenting on WF Tools, a far more technical session on the, the tools that we're implementing to manage our workflow environment uh, for Drupal 7 and then Drupal 8 and beyond. That's it from my slides. Cool. Thank you. So uh, 
Thanks, Mike. That was uh, that was fantastic. Um, so at this point, what we'll do is we'll uh, I'm going to have a couple questions that, that I'm going to ask, and then uh, I encourage you, as I mentioned before, to think about the questions that you want to ask Mike and sort of how we can get the most out of this session, given that you uh, do have access to them here. So certainly take advantage of it. Um, so, um, so Mike, one of the first questions I had was, you know, you mentioned that um, you guys were looking at Drupal um, early days and six and then seven came out, but what you found was both consumer pharma and um, the biopharma were doing CMS selection processes and sort of in parallel. So what triggered the organization to start the CMS selection processes that ultimately resulted in the selection of Drupal? Sure, so, so, so really it was, it started off from the capability side. So we had a lot of these Snowflake solutions and a lot of, lot of cases brand teams were meeting their objectives through, through, through their own agencies and their own implementations. But there were some, some limited platforms in place. And we, we quickly got to a point where some of these, like what were originally considered edge cases, like you know, five years ago building a site to work on a mobile phone, we didn't need to build platforms to do that, became absolutely mandatory. And as soon as those, as soon as those pockets of consistency couldn't deliver on that, then it opened kind of a can of worms of a lot of other things that those common platforms couldn't couldn't deliver. And that led to the case of led to the case of we're we're implementing things that are far more complex. We need to take a better platform approach to this. Interesting. Interesting. I know um, you know one of the things you talked a lot about at the end was your ability now, you've gotten to this place where you guys can deliver sites in days. Right. Um, and I know a few years ago, I think back to the conversations we had, we talked a lot about how long it took to develop sites in some of the existing systems you had. Uh, give us a, f a f little bit of a flavor of how, how big a change this has been at Pfizer and sort of what it took to build a, a website the old way. Yeah, it's, it's a massive, it's a massive, massive change. So. There's, there's a lot of benefits that come out. If I talk about the SaaS approach, so that's one extreme. So that's the extreme where you can, you can really have a website come in on Tuesday, and if, if there, it, can, it can absolutely be built on fr by Friday, and in many cases it can be approved and, and ready to launch by Friday as well. There's a lot that needed to happen in that SaaS platform to make it, make it necessary. I mean, there's so much consist consistency on that platform that we are security testing this, for example, at a platform level. So our security testing process that takes multiple weeks with multiple months of lead time happens on a platform level. So if you're building this as a one-off, one-by-one site, by default, you have a multi-month multi process to start off with. We don't compromise on security, so it means that even if, uh, even if that site came in on the Tuesday and put its request in on the Tuesday to, uh, to, to be security tested, even in the best case, and that was our highest priority site for Pfizer to launch, it's still going to be a couple of weeks before it can be out the door by default, no matter how fast you can, you can build it. And there are a lot of processes around this that we've managed to optimize or, um, or really perfect for a SaaS-type deployment using, using, using this, kind of, this kind of structure. Um, so, you know, a lot of what you do, I, I believe, is on the IT and sort of the technical side, and your customer within Pfizer is the business, the yep. product managers in market. Um, what's their awareness of Drupal? Do they know they're using Drupal? I mean, how, what's your interaction with them from a technology perspective? I, I didn't have this question, but I do have, uh, just to give you, uh, sorry, I didn't know this question in advance, but just to give you, and I was talking about this yesterday, to give someone an idea of the awareness of this in, within Pfizer. I was, with, I was with one of my colleagues when we were, when we're introducing Drupal to, uh, to a marketing team. This was, this was at the very beginning. Um, and we were introducing that <laughs> Drupal to that marketing team and talking about a lot of the advantages of why we wanted to build this in Drupal. And we got to the end of the conversation, they were convinced why we wanted to do this in Drupal. But their, their response then came to, why am I building it in Drupal but not in Bangalore? You guys came to us. You guys came to us a few months ago and had this great outsourcing opportunity, and you were building sites in Bangalore cheaper than you'd ever ever done it before. So there's certainly been a learning curve. Um, we started off with just the requirements coming from the business and having to meet those requirements. So I'd say a lot of the success of this platform has just been building credibility, understanding and pushing the boundaries of what what the brand teams want to do, and then delivering on that very very consistently. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so, you know, you talked a lot about platform, and obviously platform is a really important piece of your story. Um, you know, you, you mentioned you have PaaS and SaaS, and you work with Acquia. Um, as you think back to the selection process, 
the fact that you had the flexibility in your deployment models and sort of these, how important a role did that play in your selection ultimately of Drupal as compared to the other technologies you were looking at? There, there wasn't another technology that we were selecting that could deliver that full scale of the smaller sites to the larger sites. We, we knew in that selection that we, uh, we needed to tackle that full spectrum and we knew that that was going to be a critical, critical to our success. But the competitor to Drupal in that space was implementing multiple technologies. So this was a, a major win for Drupal in the fact that we could choose one technology. And it still astounds me the fact that we really have picked one technology when you see the complexity on one end versus the, 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 the microsites that are built on the other end. And it, it, was, it was only Drupal that could deliver that. But further than that, it was only, it, it really made Drupal, Drupal win from another benefit that we could actually invest in those and those SaaS components, so the common features that are going to be deployed across the rest of our sites. By not splitting this across two different technologies and having to implement every single one of those functionalities twice, it, it really actually works. We, we built sites in that SaaS platform that were built very fast, maybe took, took a, a marketing opportunity that wouldn't have otherwise been addressed without, without that platform, but then have grown, and then have required custom functionality and things that were one-off for that particular site. And using this model, it's, 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 it's magical. You can take it, take it out put it into your past platform and then put in whatever layer of integration or functionality you might want on top of that as well. So it was, it was, the, only, it was the only solution that really offered that. Yeah, no, and that's a, you know, that's the, this be the only product pitch here. I think that's a big piece of when we built our SaaS platform, Aqua Cloud Site Factory, that freedom and flexibility to move between one model, right? Because, you know, I think the hard thing when we're talking to business people is sites are not the static thing. Okay, it's launched, now good, we can go on to the next thing. It becomes this entity that grows and evolves and changes and you you know being locked in in some cases is is worse now you got to start over again um, I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll um, I'll open it up to the audience um, what I will ask is is maybe if, if you can come to the microphone the session is being recorded and so that talking to the microphone in the room will be uh, and we'll be able to capture the questions for, for anyone who's listening or listens to this later um, so a lot of folks in here aren't um, organizations like Pfizer, but they're actually service providers, consulting, digital agencies. So what advice do you have for consulting firms, for agencies in the room, in terms of how they should think or approach working with a company like Pfizer, you know, a large, global, multinational, you know, Fortune 100 company? It's a good question. I have to think a bit, a bit about the answer. So we, we work with, when we're talking about that spectrum of, of different sites that we're launching, the reason we're working with multiple vendor partners is we find that there are, there, each, each of the vendors have their sweet spot across that spectrum at, at some point. You don't want to take the, uh, you, you want to be developing those smaller sites as efficiently as possible, as fast as you possibly can. And that's typically a completely different skill set that we need at the other end of, at the other end of the scale. Um, what I'd say is, is we, we've got to a situation where we're, we're using that kind of internal team and, and, and also with Acquia, where we're really understanding the, the quality of our Drupal, Drupal solutions. And we're really getting into a, a, a situation where we can, that quality typically maps over to the value of that over time. I mean, reuse is a massive, massive component of this. So if you can, if your organizations don't understand or, or aren't reusing components to, to, um, or aren't asking you to build things in ways that can be reused, help them understand that story because it's, a, it's something I haven't talked about here too much, but it's, it's, it's a kind of a whole other vector for this for how you can bring value to these kind of projects. So not every, every Drupal shop we approach thinks that way or vendor we approach thinks that way. So if you do then, or if, if, if you either do it by default or convince the organization you're working with why they should build these things, then you're gonna be bringing a ton of extra value to the projects. That's great, that's great. So, uh, so I'd love to take some questions from the audience. So, uh, so someone be the first one. John, are you going to do it? Yeah. All right, thanks. It's always the first one's always the hardest. <laughs> uh, so you talked about how uh, the brand managers have their own agencies, and um, now there's you know you've got the the SaaS on site factory, and you've got Pass as well. Um, what's those agencies, I assume, now have to have something to do with that. They have to be integrated into that process when there's a new theme built for a new product or something like this there, building into Site Factory as well. Can you talk about um, that process and maybe how uh, you got those agencies involved or whether that was to do with Acquia or, or who else? Yeah. Sure. So I'd start by making sure I'm clear about the term 
agency and what I'm what I'm doing with with the agency. So I would separate that from the Drupal shops, for example. So I, yeah. I, I, I'm just not going to bucket these two together. I would say our agencies and the partners we're working there with there from the creative side, particularly the ones that we're working with with the kind of content we're expecting them to produce. Yeah. Building these sites is not in their core. No. Uh, in their core So I believe you work with WPP and a couple of other. Work with a lot, lot, yeah. of, lot of agencies. Yeah. Um, so not Drupal's not their thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Drupal, Drupal's not their thing, and if they do implement it, they'll they'll typically outsource it to a partner. Sometimes yeah. some of the partners we're using for Drupal development anyway. Um, but it's it's not really their it's not really their th their thing, and because you work with a lot of different agencies and a lot of different markets, the consistency has to really come from Pfizer. Right. So you have to get into a model where you change your relationship with 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 those those the agencies to a, to a degree, and you have the right selection for the right vendor for the build, and you have have an appropriate not necessarily fully centralized, but you have the appropriate model in place to be able to marry these things together, so that you can have the the agency focused on what they're doing, which is typically in that top like golden category, and then you have a team that can can effectively understand that to be able to implement that in a. You know, Piece of technology, technology implementation beside that. So you're marrying, uh, you know, the the marketing agency who's doing, you know, the, the PSTs or the first design with a Drupal <laughs> agency who does the theme, that kind of thing, and then yeah, and, and, and we manage that, and we put in build kits and guidelines to help help manage that transition between them. Cool. Thanks, John. Yes, uh, it's at the microphone. Go ahead. You guys can form a line. I win. I'm closer. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Um, I have a question. I can imagine that on your local markets there are some people who are reluctant to a standardized solution, who think that they were far ahead of the crowd and they might even be further ahead of what you're providing now. Um, do you have any best practices on how getting these people on board? So if they're further ahead, let them be further ahead. I mean, we're not, we're not, trying, to, we're not trying to solve for every single possible use case. And we, we listen very closely to our individual markets to help understand common trends of things that might want to be implemented. But this implementing this platform has been, uh, I say it's 100% carrot and 0% stick. We try and help out with, with implementing these, these services, and that's been very, very successful. If it turns out that a marketing campaign in an individual market, considering all the extra process they have to go through to launch their site, can still be more effective, I don't believe that happens on a large scale. But if it really is more effective, let it run in that. Let it run in that way. Um, so, there's a lot of work we're doing in terms of proving the value internally to, to this, or showing the value to, to each of these individual teams. But to be honest, that's that's not largely been. It's not been really a, largely a challenge that we've had to address with this platform. I would say I've spent the majority of my time at Pfizer on the other side, where that has been a much larger challenge. Where there's a typically that proprietary implementation, and you're one of the first and you're fighting against it. Thanks. Hi. <clears throat> I have kind of two backgrounds. I'm, I'm a Drupal developer, but on the other hand, I'm also a pharmacist working um, at a small pharmaceutical company as a product manager. And so I try to um, bring Drupal into our um, organization on an internet um, base as a product platform. And what I, I think is for, always for us, the biggest challenge is to somehow get our approval processes, which differ from brand to brand, from product, from market to market, um, and to get this into Drupal. So we often have the situation that we have a content creator, we have um, a search engine optimization team, we have the approval person, we have the product manager, we have many different people who differ from project to project, and do you manage to get all this into your workflow tools so, and into Drupal? So we, we so when, when we're talking about our workflow within, within, within Drupal for, for, for promoting content, you talk to a lot of the challenges that we have. You, you know, if you talk, think about that environment and you think at the other end of the scale, directly editing something on production, you can see why these things aren't going to jive and why these things aren't going to work together. But on the other hand, when implementing a platform on this scale, we can't. We have to have some like common integration points to some of these some of these processes. So I'd say we've we've optimized and we've built specific features or functionality into our platform to support these kind of approval processes. But in many in many many cases in, in many markets, they're offline processes. And so so we've built functionality to optimize those as much as we possibly can can do. Especially where when it gets more complicated around things like responsive design and translation and these kind of things, we optimize to integrate with those processes. 
but the objective of the digital platform isn't to, isn't to run those processes. Mm -hmm. It's to, to, to integrate with, with the existing processes in each of the markets. Okay, so, so the approval process oftentimes is also completely outside of Drupal, and somebody signs a document, which is a legal, legal document, for example, which needs for the registration or... Yeah, exactly that. So that process happens outside, and we, we make sure that we're we're putting the workflow within, within, in within Drupal to give you absolute confidence that the, the thing that you're saying, yes, the published to production, matches the PDF file you got in front of you and the thing that was legally, com legally signed off by compliance to be launched. But do you still work then with revisions that uh, if you have new content, for example, that the old content is saved in, in the Drupal yep. platform? Yep. So th there's lots of advantages that come from that. So um, we use those tools, so we, of course we have revisions on, on, on all content, on all, all content types that we're, we have within our sites, and that also helps when, when that person sat there with the PDF file fr in front of them of this is what was signed off through that legal process, then revisions of things can help, help with that process by doing like a diff between what was there before mm -hmm. and what's there now, and am I comfortable that that diff is fully represented in this document and can be legally signed off mm -hmm. uh, to deploy. I think. There's, there's more that can be done to optimize, uh, optimize that area, and particularly as we're, we're stretching the boundaries of some of the additional channels you want to deploy to, then, then that needs to be done, done, done faster. But um, I'd say we built enough into Drupal to really optimize that process versus, versus doing it from scratch, which is very, very manual. Can I ask one last question? Um, so as a Drupal developer, I also work for political parties and, and also in our company, I think they also want the approval process inside of Drupal. They want this. Do you have tools inside your workflow tools? That you, you'll get excited by the WF tool sessions tomorrow, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. Come along to that. What we've, it, we've built that, or it's been built effectively as a, as, a, as a framework to manage the very, very differing types of workflow needs in each one of our, each one of our markets. And the, the requirement we're talking about here is, is typically medical content or, f or promotional content related to a pharmaceutical product. We have a lot of different types of products or diff lots of different types of properties at the same time that might not be promotional might, or might not contain medical content, in which case probably some of the, the workflow types you might expect for your other, other sites are more relevant. And the idea of, of the implementation with WF Tools is to cover this spectrum, to be flexible enough to cover the spectrum. In some cases, it will be the, the, the method for signing off content to go to production fully in, in case within that system. In some cases, it will be integrated with the, the other processes to the point that we can, we can optimize this as much as we can. Okay, cool. You're doing more pitching than I am, and you're I'm the IT guy. <laughs> as I said, I spent most of my time outside of IT advising. Mike, thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, specifically the platform uh, information. Maria Striano, a Blink Reaction. I have a couple of questions. First one is, uh, when you work with these multiple design agencies, do you have any guidelines for designing uh, uh, Drupal sites? Uh, the reason why I'm asking is we all know that uh, we can implement any kind of design in Drupal, but if the design is so-called like Drupal friendly or responsive uh, uh, design friendly and adaptive, that makes a huge difference uh, um, for the time frame. Right, and it, it's, it's a very good question. So I would say on a lot of our, a lot of our more basic sites, we, we don't. Um, if something comes up and it's, it's clear that it's gonna take a lot of time to implement it this way in Drupal versus we really believe that you could implement it this way, particularly, particularly if you're building on also on the, the, the SaaS platform. You know, it, it's going to take us longer to build this particular widget in this way, whereas Blinker building building some of those, if you if you want to build it, um, if you want to build it in the Drupal way, it might be easier. So we have some discussion around that, but I'd say that really comes up on some of our larger projects when you maybe maybe building a web application on Drupal. Um, it's, it's, it's easy to have an agency who are building, a, building the concept for a large, large application to build many, many dozens of wireframes coming, covering the full functionality. And we even had a project recently where there were, there were say, we got into the, about a dozen wireframes covering functionality that was already delivered by Drupal. So they're kind of redesigning or re-implementing this. And on all of those larger projects, 
it's a member of my team, so that core, that core engineering team that are running this platform that are engaged in each one of those projects. So we try and catch those things early on enough to say, you know, consulting with those projects and, uh, and understand you know, the, that, that doesn't make sense to implement it quite that way within Drupal. We can optimize this, we can do this a lot faster if we do it, do it this way. I say it's my team, but it's really guys I have from Acquia doing, doing that. I, I take the credit for. Thank you. And I have one more question in regards to the deployments. Uh, due to the um, re business requirements uh, and the approval process, you mentioned that all content changes are uh, done on staging environment and then after approval they are deployed to production. How do you handle websites where you have user-generated content like um, uh, five-star voting, comments, uh, submissions, form submissions and other? It's a, it's a good question. It's not, it's not easy. And there's the, when I said that the short-term implementation was the script to move from staging to production, that comes along with some guidelines that tells you in a lot of technical detail how this process works. And there are a number of different ways you can preserve specific content on production while, while running that staging to production process. So I would say it's, it's very far from perfect. And it's a, it's, a good, it's a good use case that's absolutely covered using, um, using the WF implementation. However, a lot, of, a lot of the sites that we have user-generated content on production, it's typically things like five-star voting or some comments or the more, the things that are easier to solve for rather than, rather than sites where the majority of the content is, is, um, is starting from production effectively. Thank you. So I have a, a quick question on something that I'm sort of deeply passionate about, which is contribution. Um, I know that uh, you have uh, done multiple contributions to the, to the Drupal ecosystem, and you have part of your, pro your, your platform is um, out, out in the world, and part of it is internal. So it's sort of a two-part question. One is, how do you manage that, your internal developers, your contractors contributing, and how do they know what they can contribute, what they can't contribute? Um, and the second one is, how do you measure sort of, or can you measure some sort of ROI that is, has this helped you like, be better? Has the contribution helped you? And how did you justify that internally to keep doing it? Good, good, good set of questions, right? So contributing, contributing back is something that absolutely needs, needs to happen in order for this to, to work long term, be sustainable, et cetera. It's something that is without a doubt, without a doubt has to happen. But at the same time, it's of course not, it's not the easiest of things, of, of things to do. I would say we're, we're really, really getting started on what we're doing in this area now as it's early days enough, that, it's early enough days, you know, 18 months in, that I would say we, we, we were learning a lot more from the community and we weren't really getting things to the, to the quality that we could really add a huge amount of value until, until the last six months or so. So in the last six months or so, we've had, we've had larger projects, things like WF Tools, that would be very beneficial to, to ver m many other companies to implement. So when there are cases like this, it's, it's, an, it's, an agreement to, it's an agreement with the individual developers, whether they're internal or with a particular vendor, to publish this, this to Drupal.org, or in some cases where it's not Drupal specifically, to GitHub in, a, in an appropriate way. So I would say that's, it, it's largely, um, just through close communication and expectation between my, me and my team as to what, what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate. But really, it's, it's, it's only starting to, to come up in more detail now as there are some of these, um, there's some of these larger investments in, that we're, we're making to fix problems that haven't been, been widely fixed in, in other areas. I would say internally, the, my management in particular really understand the value from doing this. There's, there's, there's a lot of great cases that I can go, when I go into more detail and more specifics about what we've implemented and how successful that's been, that really that's the opportunity to kind of go and sell how we've managed to be so efficient riding off the back of what other people have been built, have built, and, and, and really the, when you talk through the whole case of how we've been successful, what we're building and how we want to contribute back, it's quite an easy story, it's quite easy to understand why you have to do that. And for these larger, in larger investments, we're trying it out with something like WF Tools, where we want, other, we want other companies to be using that. And I think, I hope that will be my case study to go and take and say, hey, we built this, it 
perfectly met our use case. It made us even faster and even, even more efficient on these platforms. And these other companies have adopted it. And as a result of that, here is the, here is the benefit we see from other people helping to maintain it. Yeah. So that will be my, my one first use. Yeah, case. I, I remember being in uh, one of the meetings we had in New York where we sort of walked the rest of the Pfizer team through the Views story and how you know, Views started out with a single company's investment. You know, it's become the most popular module and now is moving into Drupal 8. And, and you know, it's very easy to quantify. I know Mike Myers does this in large-scale Drupal to say, you might spend $50,000, but look, $2 million of investment has happened in this module. You get to take advantage of that or you could do it yourself. And, and that's an important story to tell. And I think it's an important piece of understanding the business model of open source and help to tell that. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, the one thing I will say, and maybe you can talk on it real quickly, is the role of programs like large scale Drupal um, to you know, contribute in ways that may not be code, but also but, uh, move the project forward as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we're, we're very, also very excited about large scale Drupal. And th that's where I see larger investments of things like the, the, the WF Tools project we're doing really, really living. Where, and I'm really excited about, and this is, this is something we talk with, with, with Mike about a lot, but there is huge, huge potential there for where the timescales and the investment from a number of companies are there to the point that we can, we can really get into a model to collaboratively development on a few of these, these areas. Because when you're collaboratively development, developing in an, in an environment like, like the, LSD, the LSD group, it's much easier to then go and publish this, and, and particularly not just publish it, but productize it to something that the um, that, that, that other companies can really pick up, adopt, and use. So that's really the right home for doing these kind of things, and, and I hope hope we can do a lot more in, in that kind of uh, environment as well. Oh, fantastic. So. Thanks, Brian. Um, you nicely articulated the the sort of the challenges of taking a proprietary system, cutting the corners off making it nice and round. Um, I guess the question is a couple of parts for me. So we've got the migration to Drupal 8. Dries touched upon this this morning. It's not going to be easy. Um, you've clearly built up a significant platform. You've then got custom contrib. You're developing that out. I can see how that works from a SaaS perspective. Obviously, from a pass sort of buy-in, um, what would you recommend to large-scale organizations or agencies to mitigate the risk of going from seven to eight. You're clearly going to be held up as an exemplar. So I think you're probably a good case study to show us how we could be in a good place in maybe six to nine months' time. Right. So it, it's a topic of, of, a lot, of, a, of a lot of debate, of course, at the moment. And I'm sharing Mike's opinion here really, rather than really than anything that's really been, been clearly um, planned within Pfizer at this point. But along with the discussion around moving from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, which we're very excited about and we're largely very excited about it because I expect to be talking about this platform in a number of years and what we've continued to do with this platform rather than talking about the next technology that we picked up, which is ultimately what gonna happen, what's going to happen if we just continue on with, with 7. We pointed to some of those challenges with 7 that are not going to be fixed in 7. Those long-term solutions don't come in 7. So we're very realistic about where we are, and I would say as much as you see many, many sites moving to Drupal, you know, several per week, I think we maybe would be doing more if it wasn't for the fact that we knew eight was coming and wanting to make the appropriate investment there. I think there's a lot of discussion as well around, uh, kind of core to, to my opinion of how I, how I, how I see us running this, <coughs> our own migration. There's lots of discussion around making eight backwards compatible with seven. So not just can eight be backwards compatible with seven, but do a few large organizations want to get together and figure out a way to build some legacy module to make that happen? I don't personally think that's, that's, that's something you should be pursued past that kind of sentence. It's, it's not, you've got, to, you've got to move on. And I think if you get into a structure uh, as we have where we're very clear on what these key functionalities are, when you've implemented them once and you know there's these 50 things that I've got to get ready for Drupal 8, then the, the investment across an organization this size to actually get those things migrated across to Drupal 8 is nowhere near the scale of investment as, say, switching from Drupal to another technology. So it has to be, the story has to be very clear and has to be well articulated to meet the expectations from a Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 migration. Don't let anybody begin to think it's gonna be a, a one button upgrade from, 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 from any angle. 
but I think having a platform strategy and having a good case of the, the value of these platforms and a good case for, for where they're going to go will, will help that. So that's, that's how I expect us to, to do this, be very clear on what it will take for us to move to eight, and I want us to be one of the companies leading, leading the way. I want us to have one of the first, first Drupal 8 sites. Well, Simon volunteered you, so you're all set. <laughs> good, I'm fine. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Great. Well, um, Mike, thank you so much for sharing a lot of insights. This is a fantastic session, so give it up for Mike. Thank you.